Hi, welcome to Reality Check. I'm very lucky to have Greg Kinsey uh, today with me. Uh, Greg is an amazing expert in manufacturing and not just manufacturing, but digitalization. Uh, during 35 years of his career, uh, Greg pioneered a lot of technologies that we're happily using today and uh, working with manufacturing companies to make their digitalization journey uh, a very easy one uh, to go. So Greg, uh, can you tell us a little bit about your career and uh, your story? Thank you, Ilya. First of all, it's, it's a pleasure to be here. And um, just a little bit more on, on my background. Thank you for that introduction. Um, I started my career uh, over 35 years ago, actually implementing robots, mechanical robots. Um, from there, I moved on to data platforms for manufacturing, and that was back in the 1980s uh, when it was still fairly innovative. And uh, that's when I moved from the U.S. to Europe, and I, I particularly spent a lot of time in the automotive industry in Germany and Italy and France, implementing large-scale data platforms in the 1980s. Uh, I then moved on in the 90s to the whole uh, Lean Six Sigma revolution. I uh, was a major player in, in shaping some of those things, which brought data analytics you know, into the hands of operations managers and, and into the, the daily way that you, you drive not only continuous improvement, but things like quality control. And from there, I got into large scale digital transformation, uh, working for several different consultancies. Um, the last 10 years, I ended up at Hitachi, the Japanese giant, which um, was investing in IoT. So I spent a lot of time around IoT platforms and how you integrate those types of things. And currently, I'm a partner at a firm called Argon & Co. We are uh, around 600 people headquartered here in Paris, but operating in 14 different countries. And we are a management consultancy. We're not a technology consultancy, but we focus on guiding our clients on operational strategy and operational transformation, which you can imagine today, a large part of that is related to digital and, and, and digital transformation. So the, the two things are, 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 are definitely intertwined these days. Thank you, Greg. What an amazing career. Uh, I'm out of curiosity. How different are the robots of today from uh, where you started uh, 35 years ago? That's a good question. Um, some of the robots that I worked with 35 years ago are still in use today huh? um, and in factories. Um, and so, yes, there's clearly been a, a, a revolution in robots over the over the last 35 years. Um, the main difference is that today there are they are much more smarter. There's more sensors built in. There's more intelligence built into the robots. And increasingly now the robots are becoming networked. Um, awesome. Yeah, thank you. Um, so let's um, dive right into the generative uh, AI. So from when you talk to your manufacturing customers, how much interest do you see in generative AI in manufacturing world? So what, what uh, stage do you see most of these companies to be in uh, when it comes to using and deploying Gen AI solutions in the manufacturing space? Well, I think, first of all, you need to step back and talk broadly about AI. AI has been used extensively in manufacturing for a couple of decades now in terms of uh, anomaly detection, in terms of um, uh, understanding cause and effect, in terms of recognizing patterns. Uh, we had the whole wave of IoT, which brought in more cameras and sensors and things like that. So AI is not new to manufacturing. However, what is new, and to get back to your question, generative, generative AI or, or large language models, LLMs, um, are, are very much of interest today by manufacturers. I think the, the hype is, is uh, quite strong. And most of my clients today are asking me, what are some use cases? What's being done in my industry? Uh, what, uh, here are some ideas that we have that we're trying to apply. Can you help us to apply it? So. I would say the interest level today is quite high. Um, and I think initially a lot of executives are just trying to separate the reality from the hype. And, and that's where we come in to, to help them and specifically to focus on some key use cases where they can get started quickly and get some value. 
So is it fair to say that uh, at the moment, manufacturing customers are testing the waters and doing their research, uh, preliminary research, rather than uh, full deployment? So they're early uh, in this new technology, which is not surprising. I, yeah, I, I would say so. And I would say manufacturing people are conservative by nature. Um, they tend to not jump quickly to a new technology because the risks of having your factory not run or having introducing additional downtime or security risks or whatever is, is, a, <clears throat> is a risk that they're not taking. So they're very conservative on that. And I think, um, you know, they're looking for very specific and focused use cases, which is the, the bulk of the work I'm, I'm doing now with, with my team. Okay, uh, I see. Thank you. Uh, now that we live uh, for over a year with the, this phenomena of uh, chat GPT, uh, so when you talk to your clients, what are the main use cases that uh, you see them focusing on? It's a good question. And I think, um, first of all, if you think about uh, GPT, there's really two main areas where it can bring value, two main types of use cases that I'm exploring with, with our clients. The first one is to um, assimilate large and complex um, data sets. Um, you can think about master data. You can think about data existing in multiple systems. And, and how do you pull all that together to create useful information? So it kind of addresses that whole area of, of knowledge management. Um, and, and that's one of the main areas of use cases. And I'll, I'll talk about those use cases in a minute. The, the second area is around creative tasks. And so we all know when, when GPT came out, a lot of people used it to you know, write a poem or write a story or, or some, write some song lyrics, right? Um, and it tends to be very good at, at creative tasks. And there's another set of use cases related to that. So today, uh, I tend to put the use cases into these two categories. So large data assimilation, particularly with context, and then creative tasks, also with context. So to go to the first example, <clears throat> um, I think that many companies are now starting to pilot how they can start to use a chat-based client to gather information around specific situations. So I'll give you an example. Um, if you have a machine that's constantly uh, jamming up during daily operations, you don't always know why you're not really sure um, what to do about it. And you don't even know where to look because there's no logical database in your company, that, in your factory that um, you go to to say, why is my machine jamming, right? Instead, you would, look at the, uh, you would look at the manual for the machine. You would look at the, the spare parts for the machine. You would look at um, the operator instructions. How's the operator operating it? You might look at the materials being fed into the machine, or, or have you changed the materials that you're putting in? So it can be actually quite complex. Um, where you can use chat-based is where you can start to um, put a subject in there around um, uh, a, a situation, and you can gather all that information within the context of the machine constantly jamming. So in some ways you think about it, it's, it's a little bit like how at home we, we, we've always gone to, to the web to look things up, right? You type in something on the web and how do I do this and, and why is this not working on my computer or, or whatever it might be. It, it's kind of a similar type of situation. So <clears throat> assimilating those large data sets is, is, is one example. So uh, a company, Site Machine, they're one of the leading uh, manufacturing platform providers. They've recently launched something called Factory Copilot their factory copilot basically provides an API based chat client, which uses GPT-4 to do exactly that. So using the universe of data that's within the site machine platform, their users are able to go and, and, and have chats about different situations that they might want to gather that data on. Uh, another example at Argon & Co, we've launched our, our own uh, platform which we call Edgar. Edgar is a, is a, a, a GPT-4 based um, platform, which we use to look at all the data we have inside our firm 
to understand um, how things work in manufacturing, the interaction of manufacturing and supply chain, what are best practices, what are, what are different KPIs used in different industries, what are some of the projects we've done in the past um, where we've learned from, how do we extract those key learnings? So in, in many ways, and I, and I think Argonne Co is not unique, I think the whole consulting industry has moved in this way. In many ways, we're using GPT as a way to extend the capability of the consultants, and we're using it as a way to, to manage our knowledge. And, and for years, organizations have talked about knowledge management um, without any real tools to do it with. And I think today it, it opens up um, new capabilities in, in knowledge management. So that, that's the first type of, of use case. The second type of use case. May, may I ask you a question, uh, Greg? Sorry sure. for interrupting. Uh, a couple of months ago, going back to the manufacturing uh, use cases, a couple of months ago, I was speaking to the CNC machine maker. And they were talking about the use case where uh, they onboard new workers. And uh, as we know, the uh, shortage of knowledgeable workers is uh, a big thing on the market. They train them, but obviously uh, people are people. They forget what they've been trained on and they continue operating their machines, which are quite complex. Uh, and when there is a problem, uh, they try to resolve to their to the best of their knowledge this problem and not go to their managers to ask questions. And that's a real problem when they don't go to ask questions. So the idea that we were discussing was uh, basically put all the knowledge uh, from the um, manuals for these machines and let them ask the questions, not to the managers where they afraid to expose that they forgot something, uh, but uh, ask to the model that understands all the operating manuals of the machines. Is that uh, falls into your first use case uh, using the existing knowledge? Yeah, great. Thank uh, you. Uh, absolutely. And it, it even goes beyond the, the information that's in the manuals. Mm -hmm. um, one of the biggest pain points right now for manufacturers is the retirement of the boomers. Um, mm -hmm. Most factories are run today with a lot of tacit knowledge that exists in the, in the heads of the elders who have been in those factories for 20 or 30 years, and they understand how things work. They understand why things work the way they do. And when there's a problem, typically it's the senior people that are pulled in who just simply know from experience. Mm -hmm. And so the challenge I think manufacturing faces is how do you take the tacit knowledge that exists in the minds of the elders and add that to the structured manuals and to the other information that you have. Uh, because right now, as I said, this is a, this is a, a huge problem. And there, the, 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 the second problem is there's not a lot of, of, of manufacturing labor available to replace these people who have experience. So you're bringing in people without experience and they have to learn quickly. And it gets back to your point about, you know, accessing, multiple manuals, accessing history, accessing the tacit knowledge of the elders, as accessing all sorts of related information that, that, that could be helpful. Excellent. Thank you for clarifying. So net to the next use case then. Yeah, the second, so the second one is around creative tasks. Mm -hmm. And um, we've been thinking about this for a while and I'm, I'm working with a few clients on this. And most manufacturing companies run some kind of a continuous improvement or Kaizen activity, um, which typically follows the traditional Japanese process of, of plan, do, check, act, um, or, or there's DMAIC. There's different methodologies out there. Some people refer to the, the A3 methodology as a way of storyboarding problems, uh, tough problems, critical problems, repeated problems, and trying to find out what are the root causes to those problems. Uh, the application of, of GTP on that one is early in the Kaizen process, you tend to go through brainstorming phase. And the brainstorming phase is to think about what are the possible root causes of why we have this problem. And the problem can be anything. It can be a downtime problem. It can be a quality problem. Uh, it can be bottlenecks, it can be late deliveries, um, whatever the problem might be, 
the approach you take is always the same. You start with the creative brainstorming where people get together and say, well, it might be this and it might be that. And obviously you draw upon the wisdom of the elders, which I mentioned, who say, well, in my opinion, it's always this. Um, but in fact, they could be wrong um, or they could miss an important um, possible root cause. And sometimes you use the, the Ishikawa model or the fishbone diagram where you look at different categories of, of possible root causes. So what I'm seeing is the application of, of GPT to that process early on to take what used to be uh, one or two weeks worth of exploratory brainstorming of building out uh, a root cause model and compressing that down to something that you can do quickly in a couple of hours um, by vetting out, or even a couple of minutes um, for that matter, by vetting out not different brains and different databases and different opinions uh, and different crazy ideas, but simply vetting out what's the data telling us? What are the 25 reasons why this problem typically happens? Now, granted, some of it might be wrong. Some of it might be hallucinations, uh, but some of it might be spot on. But more importantly, it might reveal something that nobody in the circle of that Kaizen team thought of immediately. So I think it's a great example of, of a creative ac activity where you can use the, the creative power of, of GPT to do something like that. Great. Um, so um, how often do you use uh, chat GPT yourself in your daily work? Um, I probably use it about once or twice a week. Um, our consultants use it much more. And I would say our technical people um, who are involved in software development also use it more. Uh, people that are creating imagery, uh, people that are, 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 are in more on the creative side of our business are also using it a lot more. Um, but again, I think probably for me personally, once or twice a week. Great. So, so far we were fairly um, theoretical on, uh, in our discussion. So let's try to dive deeper into a specific use case because um, in this channel, uh, I want to dive into the business side of uh, generative AI uh, rather than a um, theoretical. So uh, can, can you talk about a specific deployment of Gen AI, specific use case, and ideally if you can talk about what outcomes the customer sees from deploying? Okay, well, um, I'll, I'll go back to the one I mentioned. So using it for the, uh, for the Kaizen process, a food and beverage company which runs um, many Kaizen events uh, daily, weekly, in multiple sites, they began in one site to use it. And the outcomes that they generated was, um, first of all, it shortened the time of running a Kaizen, of running a continuous improvement project by... Uh, radically accelerating that front end part of, of ideation. Secondly, it created capacity for them to run more Kaizen projects. So the end result for them, uh, and they, they put it quite clearly, was um, thanks to this, we've improved our productivity of running continuous improvement projects. And that has hit our bottom line directly. Um, they didn't quote any specific numbers, obviously, but the fact that you can now run many more Kaizen projects in a specific month than you could before, simply because you've, you've accelerated the speed and the time with which you can do it. And also you've maybe found that red X earlier. And, and in Kaizen, it's always about the red X because you know, as we say, Y is a function of many, many X's. The, the top five or six X's are always obvious to everybody, but somewhere in the long tail, you might find a critical X factor that's that's we call the red X. That's really the one that's causing the problem. And and they said you know by using uh, by using GT, GPT for for the ideation process, it would automatically force us to look at red X's that we might not have thought of earlier. Yeah, you preempted my question about uh, the actual measurable outcomes uh, when you say that they didn't share the numbers, mm -hmm. uh, but um, I I understand. Um, uh, shouldn't we come up with the Kaizen in the box? And uh, do we need people in the Kaizen process at all? I think we always need people in the Kaizen process. And I, I've always said uh, for AI in general, and also I think for GPT or large language models specifically, 
it's not so much about labor arbitrage and replacing people with with you know machines but i think it's more about productivity and uh, we will always need people in manufacturing that's my personal belief um and i think that the technology can help the people become radically more productive than they are today um and that's not new we've seen that for the last 300 years and the various waves of industrial revolutions that we've been through um it's always been a productivity game awesome so um let's talk a little bit about the future so how do you see the future of uh, gen ai uh and not just gen ai but mostly the usage of gen ai um uh, is it uh, just a hype or it will live up to the expectations well first of all t- today it is a hype um but not just a hype and i think i think gen ai is <clears throat> is following uh the gartner hype curve like everything else so right now we've had the technology trigger um maybe we're in the peak of of inflated expectations which is the the second part of the hype curve then we will go through the trough of disillusionment where people might dismiss it or they might write it off and then eventually you start that you know that slope of enlightenment where you start to learn how to use it and then you hit the plateau of productivity where it brings real value i think the trick to this is that the value is not going to be invented by the tech industry i think the tech industry brings us the trigger i think the value will be created by the industrial companies that experiment with it <clears throat> so in my experience this the value always comes from from industry um i uh, certainly hear the references to the uh, value of disillusionment and gartner uh, curve <clears throat> everybody likes to talk about that but when you look at the mobile phones uh so the, this valley was not too deep uh and uh, the amount of, and the curve went up very high bringing us lots of different solutions and um uh interesting uses <coughs> of mobile phones is basically became a part of our life daily life uh, not just daily hourly uh right. every minute we use our smartphones and we can't live without them so do you think that uh, gen ai will get to this level where it will be integral part of our daily hourly lives i i think it will but i think it'll be embedded so you won't be conscious of it i i think it will your example the phone's a good one because it's something we grab onto and and we physically use it what we don't know is what's behind the phone and gen ai is already in there yeah. um and so i believe in the in in the manufacturing environment the gen ai will be integrated um not only with production equipment and production processes but also with maintenance i think maintenance is a huge area maintenance and repair mm-hmm. um as well as in uh the supply chain and sales and marketing And in fact, one of the areas that we're doing a lot of work with our clients now is around supply chain and around master data management and how you manage these these huge portfolios of SKUs um in in the whole supply demand balancing and all those types of things as well. Awesome. So any other use cases for uh, <coughs> NAI you see in the future? Besides No, I think the, I think for the future it, it's it's going to do two things. Um one is it's going to finally attack this this problem we've talked about for years in fact my whole career we've talked about it and that's knowledge management um and and I've been around the circle on this many times uh and in the end we always concluded well knowledge management is about how people share knowledge uh I think finally the technology will help us in that field and that has a huge impact for management consultant consultancies uh and so that's why you see you know the big accounting firms as well as the the boutique firms like like us are really taking it on board secondly any <clears throat> anything else that's knowledge based like scientific research like um medicine uh all these fields uh will definitely you know accelerate their abilities and their productivity i get back to the productivity word by by using it <clears throat> excuse me and and secondly i think 
jobs that traditionally are not knowledge-based will become more knowledge-based. And so like what's happened in the retail industry for the last uh, 20 years, uh, retail used to be uh, more of a, uh, of a human interaction where you go into a shop and you deal with a person and the person had zero technology back, back in the days when I was young. Um, and today it's all about the knowledge. It's about what's in stock, what colors exist, when can I have it by, you know, all those types of things. And I think bringing that to all jobs, all vocations uh, is an inevitability that, that we'll, all be, we'll all be knowledge workers at, at some point in time. Yeah, uh, that, that's a great point. I actually um, have uh, uh, a discussion right now with the uh, young startup from Silicon Valley that does digital employee. And that's exactly what they're working on today. Uh, so uh, that's an, an interesting concept. And uh, another thought that I had during our conversation that uh, paraphrasing the old Chinese proverb, uh, if you sit long enough on the bank of the river, you will see the same technology floating past you for the third or fourth time. Yeah, there, there's some, there's some truth to that, but but again, I'll go back to I'll go back to what I said about um, the use cases and unlocking the value. I think that'll come from industry, and if I go back again to where I started my career when I was uh, I was 23 years old, robots were invented, and I was working for a a, a, a tire company, and we were trying to figure out the use cases on how those robots could bring value into tire manufacturing. Um, and and what, what the team did, what the engineering team did that I was part of is we experimented <clears throat> and we could only experiment in the factory. And so while there were great robots being designed, most of them were Japanese at the time, um, the, the robot alone didn't solve the problem. And so you could sit and watch the technology flow down the river, but until you grab it, and try to try to do something with it, um, you don't really unlock the value. Yep, good point. Thank you, uh, Greg. And uh, uh, I, I hope that will become my regular final question to my guest speakers. So what is your question to my next speaker? Well, I think, I think it depends who your next speaker is. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I, one question I have about, um, about generative AI is how will it impact the software industry specifically? So if you think about how software is designed, how it's built, how it's improved, how it's customized, how software is sold, how software is serviced and updated, um, I can imagine there's huge opportunities around that. And it's, it's not something I've personally explored myself. But I think, the, I think the software industry or say the traditional enterprise application industry is still very much operating under you know, models from 20 years ago. And uh, it'll be interesting to see. And so that would be my question for your next speaker is, is how do they see generative AI impacting the software industry? Great. Greg, thank you so much. I really appreciate you taking time, um, being the first guest at my, on my channel. Uh, and uh, this, this was a very good discussion. I appreciate that. Thank you very much, Greg. My pleasure, Ilya, and, and I wish you good luck with the channel, and I look forward <laughs> to seeing the, the next speakers. Awesome. Thank you very much. Thanks.